This is the first uh, Saturday morning talk of the retreat, and uh, it's the time to uh, talk in depth about uh, what we're going to be doing here, the meditation. Later on during the retreat, I'm going to be talking about some of the obstacles to meditation, and those things which uh, empower the meditation, little things you can pay attention to, to make the meditation deeper. But uh, basically this talk this morning will be just about the the basic method of meditation. Uh, This uh, method of meditation, uh, as I was explaining last night, uh, is a way of uh, letting go of the world outside in order to access the world inside, the world of the mind. Uh, In all traditions, in all types of mysticism which we know this is a path to that world, to the world of the mind. And that realm of the mind is a very wonderful and also blissful uh, place to go to. So even though that during this meditation retreat there might be some hard work involved at the beginning, just be able to uh, bear with that hard work because uh, the result of that hard work will be some very beautiful and very meaningful states of mind which you'll experience here. And those uh, states of mind, those beautiful states, will be well worth all of the effort. It's just one of those laws of nature that without effort, without trying, so one doesn't really gain very much in this world. And whether it's a lay person or a monk, without that effort, then one will get nowhere. <coughs> but it's not just a question of effort, it's a question of skillful effort as well being able to direct your energy just in the right places. So instead of being something which hinders you and disturbs you, the effort actually does uh, produce this beautiful peacefulness and quietness. And it's a good uh, point uh, to actually know what the goal is here. It's the beautiful peacefulness and the quietness, the calmness of the mind. If you can understand that goal, then the means to achieve that goal becomes very clear. One of the teachings of the the Buddha, which always uh, struck me very uh, profoundly when I first read it, was a simple statement that a person who has like a mind of giving up, of abandoning, of renouncing, gets samadhi just so easily, gains these states of concentration just... uh, almost automatically. And what the Buddha was saying there was saying one of the the root causes to attaining deep meditation, to attaining these peaceful, blissful states, is the ability to abandon, to let go, to give away. So, during this meditation retreat, we're not going to develop a mind which accumulates and holds on to things but developing a mind which is willing to let go of things, to let go of burdens. Yesterday or last night, I just described it as having so many suitcases you're carrying around with you through life. So much baggage, which is completely unnecessary. And to see if during this retreat anyway, you could unload as much baggage as you can. Think of all these things as baggages, burdens, heavy weights upon you. And then you have the right attitude of letting go of these things, abandoning them, giving them away, giving them up. Because that attitude, that movement, inclination of the mind of giving up is the inclination of the mind which will take you into deep meditation. So during the even beginning parts of this retreat, to see if one can gather uh, that energy of what we call renunciation, of giving away. And little by little we give away more and more and more. As we give things away, you find you feel much lighter, more freer, more unburdened. And in the way I teach meditation, this giving away, this abandoning of things, just happens stage by stage, step by step. Uh, You can go quickly through these beginning steps if you wish. However, be very careful if you go through them quickly. 
because sometimes if you pass through these stages of meditation too quickly, you find you haven't really done the beginning stages properly. It's like building a house with a very weak foundation. It goes up very quickly, but it comes down very quickly as well. So if you can spend a lot of time on the foundations, on the first story, on the second story, making all of those uh, groundwork very, very strong and firm, then when it gets up to the higher stories, they too are firm. So in the way I teach meditation, I like to begin at a very simple stage of just giving up the baggage of past and future. And sometimes that you think that's such a, an easy thing to do, it's such a basic stage of this meditation. But if you put your attention on that, and do it properly, do it carefully, and don't go running too fast to the higher stages of this meditation. If you put a lot of attention just to being in the present moment, you'll find that you're getting a very strong foundation on which to build the higher stages. By abandoning the past and by abandoning the future, I mean all of your work, your business, your family, your commitments, your responsibilities, all of your past, your history, the wonderful times you had as a, as a youth, as a child, the bad times you had, all the past experiences, you abandon them all. You become someone who has no history for these nine days. That you don't even bring up where you were from, where you were born, who your parents were, what your upbringing was like. You don't even bring up what you were doing before you came here. All that history is abandoned in this retreat. In that way that everyone here becomes equal, just a meditator. It doesn't matter how many years you've been meditating or whether you've just started meditating. If you abandon all that history, we're all equal. We're all letting go of some of these concerns, perceptions and thoughts which can limit us and which can stop us developing these peaceful stages of renunciation. So every part of your history you let go of. Even to the point of the history of what's happened so far in this retreat you let go of that as well. Even what happened a moment ago that you let go of also. So you don't carry any burden from the past into the present. Whatever's just happened, you let it go. You don't allow it to reverberate in your mind. I once described this as developing a mind like a padded cell. When any thought or any experience hits the walls, it doesn't bounce back again. It just sinks into the walls and stops right there. So we don't allow the past to echo in our consciousness. Certainly not the past of yesterday and all that time before. Because we're developing a mind of letting go, of giving away, of unburdening, not taking up more burdens. Sometimes people think that if, or have the view, that if they take up the past, they can somehow learn from it and they can and solve the problems of the past. You should know that when you look at the past, you look at them through uh, distorted lenses. Whatever you think it was, it wasn't quite like that. That's why people have arguments about what actually happened, even a few moments ago. Why it's well known to police to investigate traffic accidents. But even though the accident may have happened only half an hour ago, Two different eyewitnesses, completely honest, will say different things. Our memory is untrustworthy. So, if you understand just how untrustworthy that memory is, you don't value the thinking about the past and bringing it all up. You can let it go, you can bury it. Just like a person who has died, you put them in the coffin, you burn them and it's done with them. It's finished. Don't linger on that past. 
don't carry the coffins of the dead on your shoulder. Because if you do, you're weighing yourself down with burdens which don't really belong to you. But all of that go, and you have the ability to be free in the present moment. And as for the, as for the future, the anticipations, fears, plans, expectations, all of that too, the Buddha said, whatever you think it's going to be, it will always be something different. The future is that uncertain. The future is that unknown, unpredictable. So it's, it's complete stupidity to anticipate the future and think about it and plan what you're going to say or what you're going to do, especially during this meditation retreat. The future is just so uncertain. Sometimes when you work with the mind, the mind is so strange. It can do some very uh, wonderful and unexpected things. It's very common for meditators who are having a difficult time, who are not getting very peaceful. Just for one meditation they sit there, here we go again, another hour of frustration. And even though they think like that, something happens and they get into a very peaceful meditation. There was, when I was in Sydney, that one person told me that while they were on the retreat, the first retreat they ever did, for nine or ten days, was after the first day and their, their body was aching so much. And they wanted to go home. And the teacher said, just stay one more day and the pain will disappear, I promise. So they stayed another day, and the pain was even worse. So they wanted to go, and the teacher said, watch one more day, and the pain will disappear. They stayed a third day, the pain was even worse. And eight days, nine days, they were in quite great pain, sitting so long. This one more day to go, the teacher said, just sit one more day and the pain will disappear. And completely unexpectedly, completely beyond one's uh, um, expectations, the final day, when he got up in the morning and started sitting, the pain did disappear. And he could sit for very long without any pain whatsoever. And he was amazed just, just how the mind is just so wonderful and produces these unexpected results. We don't know just about the future. It can be so strange and weird, completely beyond whatever you can anticipate. Little experiences like that give you the courage to abandon all thoughts of the future, all expectations of the future. Even when you're sitting in meditation, you're in pain, and you think this pain is going to... How many more minutes are there to go? How many more minutes have I to endure this? That again is going off the future. You don't know. That pain can just disappear in a moment. The next no moment might be the free one. You just can't anticipate at all. You just don't know what's going to happen. And I used to say to meditators that if you've been sitting for many hours, sometimes you think that, oh, just all the meditations I've had today, none of them have really been getting anywhere. And then one one day or one afternoon you sit down and everything gets so peaceful and quiet. And you think, ah, oh, now I can meditate. And the next meditation is awful again. And I wonder exactly what's going on here. And the first meditation teacher I had told me, and it's something which was strange, that's why I remembered it. He said, there's no such thing as a bad meditation. All those things which you call bad meditations, meditations which were frustrating, which did not meet your expectations, all those meditations are where you put in the work. And the good meditations is where you draw your paycheck. It's like a person who goes to work all day Monday, doesn't get any money at the end. What am I doing this for? All day Tuesday, still doesn't get anything. Another bad day. All day Wednesday, all day Thursday, four bad days in a row, working and not getting anything. 
the fifth day, Friday, they work all day, and then the, the boss gives them a paycheck. Wow, why can't every day be Friday? Do you understand the simile here? It's all the work which you do in the difficult meditations. That's where you build up your credit. That's where you build up the strength. That's where you build up the momentum, the inclination to peacefulness. And it comes along when all the external factors are all in line and you've built up your internal factors to work against the hard meditations. Internal factors, external factors are all there for very nice meditation. And that's why it works. But you find you can't just get the good meditations without doing what you call the bad meditation. That's where you put in the effort, that's where you put in the work, that's where you gain the strength. The skillful means, the skillful attitudes in order to develop this beautiful meditation. So we learn how to abandon the past and how to abandon the future. This is baggages which we do not need to pick up. And that's even in one meditation, in one moment. Don't pick up the baggage of the next moment. What should I do next? That's going off into the future. Don't pick up the baggage of the future. How many more minutes till the bell goes? In the last retreat I gave in Sydney, one lady came up in the interview and said, I was, I was angry with you all day but for two different reasons. She said, all the early meditations, I was angry with you because you didn't ring the bell quickly enough. I'm sure that it was over the hour. For the last meditation, I was angry with you again, she told me, because I got into a nice beautiful state, and when you rang the bell, I'm sure it was too early. You cannot win as a meditation teacher, ringing the bell. But the point was, she was only saying that tongue-in-cheek. There's a bit of uh, uh, a smile when she told me. She wasn't really angry. But this is what happens when you go anticipating the future. When you go thinking about how many more minutes are there to go. That is where you torture yourself. That is where you're picking up a burden which does not belong to you. So be very careful not to pick up that burden. How many more minutes are there to go? If that's what you're thinking, you're not paying attention to what's happening now. You're not doing the meditation. You've lost it. You've lost the plot. And you're asking for trouble. So keep right in this present moment, this present moment awareness. To the point where you don't know what day it is. You don't know what time it is. Morning, afternoon. All you know is what moment it is. Just right now. And you become into this beautiful, like, monastic type of time scale where you're just meditating in this moment and you just really haven't got a clue whether it's Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. You don't know what month it is. Once when I was in Thailand, I actually didn't, and this was honest, I didn't know what year it was. I'd forgotten. It's marvelous when you get into that timelessness. A completely different realm. A realm which is much freer than the realm which we sometimes have to live in because of our, our work commitments or our duties. You go into the timelessness of existence as you are experiencing this moment now. Human beings have been experiencing this moment for thousands of years. It's been just like this. No different. You'll come into the reality of now. So once you abandon all past and all future, you come to a very magnificent and awesome experience of the present. You're actually alive. You're there. You're mindful. And that has to be the first stage of this meditation. Just the mindfulness of the present moment. Just doing that much, you've let go of a a great deal of what stops you gaining deep meditation. So put forth a lot of effort in that first stage until it's really strong, 
until the mindfulness of the present moment is well established and that you find you've forgotten where you live. You don't know what you're going to do when you get when you leave here. It's forgotten it all. All your history and your future have disappeared from you. When that happens, you realize you've really come on this retreat. You've really entered the retreat. You're not still at home. You're not already left into the future. You're right here. So this is what we start with present moment awareness and you actually refine that even further down to silent awareness of the present moment sometimes people find a great difficulty in stopping this thinking mind this inner chatter this inner noise inside and one of the very beautiful ways of overcoming the inner chatter is to have such refined present moment awareness that you're watching every moment so closely that you haven't got time to say or comment about what has just happened. Because that's where the inner chatter comes. It's a comment on that which has just gone past. What was that? That was good. That was unpleasant. All of these are comments about experience which has gone. And if you're making a comment about an experience which has just gone, you are not paying attention to the experience which has just arrived. You're just dealing with old guests rather than meeting the new ones which are just coming in. You can imagine yourself to be like a host of a party, meeting the guests as they come in the door. If one guest comes in and you meet them, and then you go talking to them about this, that and the other. You're not doing your job to pay attention to the new guest who comes in the door. All you can do, because a guest is coming in the door every moment, is to greet one, and then go to the next one and greet them, and go to the next one and greet them. But you cannot get a conversation with any of them, because you'll miss the one coming afterwards. This is what happens in the mind. All these experiences, they come in the door of our mind, one by one in succession. You greet them with mindfulness. But if you get into a conversation with your guest, then you'll miss the next experience coming in. If you are right in the moment with every experience, with every guest which comes into your mind, then you can't have any space in a conversation. You can't chatter, you can't say anything because you're completely taken up with greeting, with mindfulness, everything which arrives in your mind. So this is a refined present moment awareness. It's a silent awareness of the present moment. It's being that in every moment that you haven't got space to say anything. And you find when you can develop that sort of silence that it's like another great burden being given up, being abandoned. It's like you've had a big rucksack on your back and you've trudged through many miles, through 40, 50 years of miles with that rucksack on your back. And finally you have the courage and you have the advice to take that rucksack off, to put it on the ground. And you feel so relieved, so free, so light, of not having to be burdened by this inner chatter. Sometimes it's through the inner chatter we think we know the world. But that inner speech, it doesn't know the world at all. It's the inner speech which weaves the delusion of ignorance, it's the inner speech which convinces us to be angry at our enemies and to have attachment to those people we desire. It's that inner speech causes all of the problems of our life. It creates fear, it creates guilt. It builds it up through its 
own illusions. It would be marvellous for each one of us if we can just abandon that inner speech long enough to realise it's so much more fun being silent than speaking. It's so much more uh, awesome, so much more producive of wisdom, of understanding, to be silent and to think about things. In the silence you produce understanding, not through thinking. So when you realize it's more fun and it's more valuable to be silent, silence becomes that much more attractive. Silence becomes what the mind inclines towards, to the point where it only thinks if it really has to, if there's some point to it. And you know that most of your thinking is completely pointless, doesn't lead anywhere, doesn't get you anywhere, just gives you a headache basically. So the second stage becomes a silent awareness of the present moment. And you can spend all day just doing the first stage, all day doing the second stage, or all retreat just doing those two stages, if you want. And if you can maintain that silent awareness, if you can get that far, then you've gone a long way in this meditation. Because in that silence, in that silent presence of just now, you'll just experience so much, so much peace, so much joy, so much wisdom, that that will be well worth the retreat. Just getting that far will be marvellous. If you want to go further, instead of having silent awareness of whatever arises in the mind, you develop the silent awareness of just one thing. Here we're letting go, abandoning the diversity of the world. There's two ways of looking at the world, diversity and unity. The silent awareness is where you come in contact with the diversity, which is a reality of the world. At least you're getting real here. You're actually experiencing the world as it is. But if you can abandon the diversity of that experience, where one moment you're aware of the birds, the other moment you're aware of sound, the next moment you're aware of the feelings in the body, a feeling here and then a feeling there, that's like a diverse sort of mind. And in a way of meditation, you will recognize eventually that the diversity is a burden. That the mind is flitting around from one thing to another and thereby giving itself a burden, a pain, an affliction. So instead of just having many things for the mind, to pay attention to, you deliberately just choose one thing, and this is the breath, the experience of breathing. You'll find that if you develop silent awareness of the present moment to a very good degree, you'll find that when you turn that silent awareness onto the breath, it's not that hard to follow the breath from moment to moment. The reason it's not that hard is because the two major obstacles to breath awareness have already been subdued. Those two major obstacles are, first of all, going off into the past and the future. The second obstacle is the inner speech. Those are the two main obstacles to breath awareness, which is why I teach these two preliminary stages and ask people to develop these two preliminary stages very well first, before they take up the breath. Because so often it happens that people jump into breath awareness, and they still the mind is just flitting to the past and future. Still it's being uh, drowned by the inner speech, and they find breath awareness so difficult. And because they jump in too quickly, and they meet that difficulty, 
they get frustrated, they give up. Because they didn't start in the right place, they didn't do the right preparation before taking up the breath. So if the mind is well prepared by these first two stages, you'll find that when you turn the attention onto the breath, it's very easy to see. You are practicing gradually. When you actually take up the breath, this is the experience of the breath. That which tells you what the breath is doing. Some teachers say to watch that experience at the tip of the nose. Some people say to watch it at the lips. Some people say to watch it at the abdomen. Some people say to move it here and then move it there. Quite frankly, that I, from my experience, the way I teach, it does not matter at all where you watch the breath. What matters is that you are watching the breath. That you're experiencing the breath. Where that experience happens to be located is irrelevant. In fact, it's very helpful not to locate the breath anywhere because we're trying to abandon the experience of the body. We're trying to abandon the perception of the body. If you go locating the experience of the breath at the tip of your nose, then basically it becomes a nose awareness, not breath awareness. If you locate it at your abdomen, it becomes abdomen awareness, not breath awareness. And there's a very subtle, but very meaningful difference between those. So we just watch the experience of the breath. So in our mind, what we know is breath going in, breath going out, one of those two. And if you know breath going in or breath going out, you have this second stage, this sorry, third stage of the meditation well down. And you go on to the fourth stage, which is just a refinement of the, the third stage, where the mindfulness expands to take in every moment of the breath. In the very beginning of an in-breath, in the very moment the first sensation of breathing in arises. And you watch those sensations evolve and change through one whole in-breath, not missing any moment of that breath. Always in the present moment, always silent, always with the breath the experience of breath. And when the breath in breath finishes, you know that last subtle moment, the last movement of the in breath, you see clearly in your mind. And you see the next moment is a pause, a few more pauses, until the out breath begins. And you see the very first moment of the out breath, and see that out-breath evolve until the out-breath disappears as its function is completed. You watch each in-breath and each out-breath like that continuously. You cannot do this through force, through holding, gripping. You can only do this through letting go of everything else in the whole universe. You can only do this through the mind, not you, but the mind, recognizing that this is a very peaceful and pleasant abiding, which is being with the breath. You'll find this will happen quite naturally during this retreat. The mind will just incline to this very peaceful, this very simple, Unity on one thing, just being with the breath in every moment. Here, we're what I always call like the springboard in this meditation. You've got a unity in the mind, a unity in the moment, a unity in silence, a unity on one thing, just the breathing. You'll find 
if you maintain that uni unified consciousness, the breath will start to disappear and fade. As the, the mind just goes, not to the experience of breath, but to what's in the centre of that, the peacefulness, the quietness, the stillness. That's why at this stage I like to start talking about the beautiful breath. Here the mind recognises this is a very peaceful, beautiful experience. You're aware continuously, from moment after moment, with no breaks in that chain of experiences. You're aware of the beautiful breath. Then, it happens quite naturally, or, if you are wise, you can nudge it along a little bit. Beautiful breath, beautiful breath. Allow the breath to disappear, and just keep the beautiful. It becomes a mind object. The mind is taking its own objects. You're not aware of the breath. You're not aware of the body. You're not aware of the world outside. All you're aware of is beauty, peace, bliss, joy, whatever you, you, whatever you will later call it. When you're experiencing this, you've long ago let go of chatter, let go of descriptions, let go of assessments. Here the mind is that still, you can't say anything. You're just experiencing the bliss of the mind. And that bliss will develop and grow and become very firm and strong. And you'll get into these jhana states in this way. I'll give more instruction about these states later on. But this is just the preliminary part of the meditation. The very fact you get into these states that you can experience just, just beauty without anything being experienced that is beautiful. Disembodied beauty, disembodied bliss, is what you'll experience. One of the problems comes if you get to this stage without having strong foundations. You start to say, wow, this is it, what should I do next? And you notice your mistakes in a chatter. What should I do next? Go into the future. You've lost the present moment awareness. You've shattered the meditation. Why? Because the initial stages weren't done firmly enough. If you do those first two stages very well, present moment awareness, silence inside, and you maintain that for a long time, when the beauty arises, you haven't been speaking inside for so long. You just can't get a thought up. You don't say anything. Silence has been well established. You don't go anticipating what might happen next. Because present moment awareness has been established for a long time. Be careful to get those first two stages well established, strong, so they will last throughout the meditation. So they will last almost throughout the retreat. So that when the beautiful stages of meditation come up, it doesn't all topple down because your foundations weren't strong enough. This is why I teach in this way. This is why I put a lot of emphasis on getting the foundations right. Because if you don't get the foundations right, when you get high into these almost jhanas, you just can't make that last jump into the deep states. Because your foundations weren't firm. So this is the basic instruction of meditation. I'll give some more instructions later on. Especially uh, the instruction, well, I'm going to give it now anyway. I'll repeat it later on. The instruction that each one of you here has the ability to enter these stages of meditation. All of them. 
There's nothing deficient in you. There's nothing lacking. The only reason why a person doesn't get into these stages, well, I'll go into all these reasons later on, but it's not something which you can't fix. One of my jobs is to encourage and convince that you have the ability to attain everything which can be attained. If you have the slightest doubt about that, then you're creating your own obstacle. You will not attain. If you have the slightest doubt, that is the obstacle. I have to be like a coach of a football team. Encouraging you, you can win. You are going to win, you will win. Because that encouragement is such an important factor in the team winning. I can back up for all of those, that encouragement, saying each one of you has got the ability, with all the teachings of the Buddha, all the suttas, never seen once the Buddha say that this person cannot achieve these stages. That's not quite accurate. There are what the Buddha called the Antaraika Dhammas. If you've uh, shared the Buddha's blood, if you've caused a schism in the Sangha, if you've um, sexually abused the bhikkhuni, and I think the other ones, if you've killed your mother and killed your father. So not the, I think if you've killed an arahat as well. So if you have never killed uh, your mum or your dad, and you haven't killed an arahat, and you haven't caused a schism in the monastic community, and you haven't shed the Buddha's blood, then you can go all the way to enlightenment. If you've done one of those things, then you've got an excuse. So what I'm, what I'm trying to say is that each one of you has the ability, has the, the opportunity, the chance, in this lifetime, in this retreat, give yourself a break. Give yourself confidence. All you need to do is follow the instructions carefully. Put forth the effort, but not just blind effort. Put forth wise effort. Use all the skill which you have, all the subtlety which you've gained through all of the years of listening to talks from all sorts of monks, reading books, all your experience. Cash all those chips in and just use the money, as it were, to get the beautiful meditation experiences and the inside experiences. These are the instructions, very clear, so you don't have to doubt them. All you need to do now is to follow them. 